Thank you so much to our worship team. Hey, if you guys listen to Christy and myself, you can take a seat. Uh, just thank you so much for, again, for being here, for worshiping with us. Uh, man, we're just honored, again, you took the time to be with us. And so right now, this morning, this whole message, we want to hear from you. Follow along with us in the comments. Make noise. And so this morning, we just believe that God is about to deposit something into our spirits, deposit something into our hearts. And I'm of the belief that our posture is so important. We can have our eyes open, our ears open, but if our hearts are closed, then we can actually miss out on what God wants to do. And so really quickly, I want us to open our hearts in your house right now. Get ready for your hearts to receive. And so if you are in a posture to receive, I want to hear from you. I want you to say in the comments, in the chat right now, just say, I'm ready. Now, I can't see you, but just I'm waiting for that first. I'm ready. I'm ready. So I know that you are ready for what God wants to do. Waiting, there it is, I hope. Love you guys. <laughs> I'm ready. Hey, right now, wherever you are, uh, why don't we just pray together to invite God into our place, into our, wherever you are, our bedrooms, um, our living rooms. Uh, if you guys just could close your eyes, open your hands with me, just repeat, say this out loud. Just say, God, you are welcome here. I want to begin this morning by reading a passage of scripture. One thing we love to do, we start in the Bible, set the backdrop. This morning we're in James chapter 4, uh, verse 1. This is what it says. It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not have ask God. If you guys have been around our church for any amount of time, you'll know that one thing I love to do, I love to give praise to my wife. You guys just saw her a moment earlier. Man, she is just amazing. I always tell y'all she is the best wife. She's the best mother. She's an amazing leader. Uh, I love her to death. I just think she's amazing. Now, for as amazing as I think she is, she knows it, I hope you know it, uh, as amazing as she is, there's also some things in life sometimes that uh, they just kind of rub me the wrong way, some of the things that she does, and, and she knows that I'm going to share some of these things, and, and you guys know this to be true as well. I'm sure you have people you admire, you love, but there's just things that they do that rub you the wrong way, and so uh, there's just a couple things this amazing woman does that rub me the wrong way, and uh, thankfully, she helped me compile this list because she knows me as well. And so I'm going to share a couple things that just rub me the wrong way about my wife. Number one is this. Uh, in our house, we have a kitchen. Generally, most houses have kitchens. And in our kitchen, under our kitchen sink, we have a garbage can. And that's kind of a spot that a lot of people put their garbage cans. Uh, but Christy does this one thing in our house. What she will do when the garbage is almost full, she will take it from under the sink and then she'll put it right in front of the sink. And she'll just leave it there. And now it's a mystery to me why she just leaves it there. I've had many theories that, you know, uh, it's getting full so she doesn't want it to smell. Uh, or maybe she wants me to take it out. I'm not sure. But she does this thing where she takes it and leaves it in front of our sink. Now, our kitchen isn't very big. There isn't a lot of space in there. And so when she does it, it gets cramped. And when she does it, it rubs me the wrong way. It just kind of, it sort of just ticks me off. It does something inside me. That's one thing. Another thing that she does that rubs me the wrong way is, uh, and, and this one I just think is so weird, but uh, it, it's just true. It's who I am. It rubs me the wrong way. Uh, when it comes to our dinners, uh, Generally speaking, for most times when we're eating dinner at our house, Christy will eat her supper in a bowl. Now, some of you guys are like, what kind of a psychopath is? The reason that this just kind of rubs me the wrong way is this. I believe bowls are meant for cereal, yogurt, soup, anything of that kind of variety. That's what bowls are made for. But Christy will pretty much try to eat anything she can out of a bowl. And it just rubs me the wrong way. And one of the reasons it rubs me the wrong way is because bowls take up more room in the dishwasher than plates do. And so we have to do more loads in the dishwasher. And the, I could go on. I have a few more things of just some things that rub me the wrong way. But this is just some of the things that we were compiling this week. And now I know a lot of you guys watching at home are saying to yourselves, you are one weird person, Harrison, that those things <laughs> rub you the wrong way, that those things make you angry. To that I say, 
I don't really care what you think of me. You want to know why? Because I know that you have things in your life that rub you the wrong way, and so I'm really not that embarrassed. But one thing that's funny, as Christy and I were kind of going through these things back and forth, and even as I share it now, uh, there's a truth that I know beneath all of these little things that Christy does that rub me the wrong way. And the truth is this. Every single one of those things is extremely petty. Like, like there's no real reason behind it. It just rubs me the wrong way. And, and the funny thing is, although I know it's petty, although I know they aren't big deals, they still rub me the wrong way. And I would wager to guess that you have things, you have people in your life that do things that rub you the wrong way. And you know, although it is petty, you can't really control how you feel. We're in the fifth and final part of our series called Heart Problems. What we've been doing in this series is we have been learning how to break free from the four emotions that have controlled us. And so far, we have looked at three of the four emotions and just looked at these the the things in our hearts that cause us pain, the things in our hearts that cause us heart problems. Now, although every single week we've looked at a different emotion, one thing that we have done in this series, one thing that has remained constant is we have looked at the same verse every single week. It's our theme verse found in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. I probably shouldn't even look at it. I hope you don't look at it. I hope you know it. I hope you've memorized it. It's been five weeks. But Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, guard your heart above all else. Why? Because everything that you do flows from it. This has been our theme verse. This is the verse that we have looked at every single week. And what we've done in this series is we have identified emotions, things in our life that have caused our heart problems. Now, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the fourth and final emotion. And I want to, before we get into that emotion, I want to give you a challenge. And it's a challenge that I'm going to give again at the end of the sermon. But our challenge is this. I hope and I pray that each and every week, or perhaps just on certain weeks, God has stirred your heart to do something. Maybe one week God was asking you to forgive. Maybe one week God was asking you to confess. Maybe last week you felt in your spirit that you need to give more. Listen, whatever you have felt in this series, if you have felt it and you have not acted on it, I am challenging you right here. I don't want to get into this morning. If you have done something, if you have felt something, something and you have not yet done it, I encourage you to do it now. You're like, now, pastor, now. You can turn this, now. Because what I want to do this morning is I'm gonna challenge you some more, but the reality is if we don't act on the challenges and the feelings that we've already felt, all we're doing is wasting our time. So I wanna encourage you, especially as this series comes to a close, if there's been anything in your life that you felt you should do, do it now. This morning, as I said, uh, if you're still with us, You haven't left to go do what you need to do. We're looking at the last emotion. And the last emotion that we're looking at in this series is jealousy. Now, the other emotions we've looked at in this series have been greed, anger, and guilt. Now, with every single one of these emotions, these emotions have carried things with them. Now, with all of these emotions, we have said there is a deeper meaning behind them. With greed, there was fear. With anger, there was hurt, and so on and so forth. Jealousy, the final emotion that we're looking at this morning, is a whole different beast. It's a whole different beast. Because the one thing about jealousy that separates it perhaps from all the other emotions is when jealousy is in our hearts, there's really no reason for it. In fact, there's really no justification for the jealousy in our heart. Now, what's funny, though, about jealousy, and as you're watching this sermon, chances are most of us could admit, yeah, I I struggle with jealousy from time to time. I know a lot of us out there like, yeah, I'm jealous. If anyone come and talk to my man, like, mm -mm -mm -mm." Like, I'm just the jealous type. Now, for the purpose of this morning, I want you to understand that's not really the strand of jealousy I want to go to. That's not really the strand of jealousy I'm talking about. The other jealousy, I think the jealousy that is more damning to our hearts, that's the jealousy that I want to talk to and I want to talk about. Now, I'm going to suss exactly what that is in a moment, but I would wager to guess this to be true for each and every one of us. Although most of us could say, hey, yeah, from time to time, I struggle with jealousy. 
I believe, and I would wager to guess, that although we can admit that we struggle with jealousy, the majority of us would not outright tell each other what exactly in life we are most jealous of. Why? Why do we struggle to make that distinction? Why would we be too embarrassed to tell people what we're actually jealous of? I think the answer is quite simple. Most of the things in our lives that cause us to get jealous, most of the jealousy that entangles our hearts, when we break it down super simple, it's this. That jealousy is petty. The things in our life that we are most jealous about, it's superficial, and it has no real justification, yet it's there. You see, I want us to think about this for a moment. What in life actually causes us to get jealous? It's when people have more money than us. It's when people are better looking than us, when they have a better job than us, a better house, a better relationship. And so the fact of the matter is, no matter how we slice it, when we expose what is in our hearts and we call it for what it is, jealousy is petty. And one of the reasons that it's so hard for us to fight against jealousy is because it is so petty that we begin to believe it's just minuscule. It's it's really nothing big. But I believe to be true that as we go through this more emotion this morning, you will see that it has, it has and can do just as much damage in our lives as the other three emotions. Now, the crazy thing about jealousy is this, and why I really believe we need to address it. I think the crazy thing and the scary thing about jealousy, and then the reality is it's kind of like this with all the emotions, but oftentimes in life, we are actually jealous of those that we are closest to. We are the most jealous of those that we are closest to in proximity. Now, what makes this dangerous is because what happens, because we are so jealous about people close to us, what that means is that this is going to affect the most important relationships in our lives. And now for some of you guys are saying, I'm not really sure jealousy is a big deal in my life. Like, it's just something that's there, but I kind of, it's not really there. I want to ask you guys a question. And this is church online, so you can be honest, you can be open, you can be vulnerable. Have you ever come to a place where you celebrate when someone close to you actually fails in something? Have you guys ever been there? Have you guys ever seen someone that you actually love and they gained a little bit of a weight and something inside of you actually grinned and you started to feel better about yourself? Come on, this is church online. We can be honest. Has there ever been a relationship around you that ended and part of you actually felt okay? Like, mm mm-hmm, and now we're both single at least. Like, come on, somebody. You see, what happens, and the crazy thing about jealousy is that jealousy actually causes us to celebrate failures. Now, with every single emotion, what we said, we said that greed is connected with fear, anger with hurt, guilt with shame. You see, for all of those emotions, there was kind of something that we could at least inside of us internally justify the way that we feel. But let me ask you a question, and I think you know the answer. Is there any possible way for us to justify celebrating the failures of other people? No. But the fact of the matter is this, and if you're watching online, if you're brave enough in the comments, you can raise a hand. How many of us have ever celebrated the failures of people around us? You see, if that is something that happens in our hearts, I would suggest that we have a bigger issue with jealousy than we want to let on. And the thing about jealousy, because jealousy is so unprovoked, jealousy is actually one of the greatest indicators that we have a heart problem. Now, if you've been with us through this series, one thing that you'll know is that we've been bringing these problems. And for every problem in our heart, we have brought a solution. Now, this morning is no different. We're going to bring a solution. But before we get to the solution, I need to peel back the curtain a little bit further when it comes to jealousy. Because you see, although jealousy has no justification, the reality is this. There is a deeper meaning, a deeper understanding to jealousy than often meets the eye. And so before we can get to the solution, I need us to understand jealousy at its core. And so what we're going to do, I want to go back to James chapter 4 for a second because I believe that James chapter 4 really breaks down what jealousy actually is. This is what it says again in verse 1. This is what we read at the start. He says, what causes quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Now, this is so interesting 
Because the essence of what James is saying, this verse is actually quite simple. What he is saying is this. He's saying that conflict in your life, that, that, that internal conflict for a lot of us, he says, where does it come from? Where, where do those desires come from? He said, it's quite simple. The desires that you have in your heart, those battles within you happen when you desire something, but you do not have it. When you covet, what does covet mean? Covet means to want something, to, to, to strive after something, to lust for something. He's saying it's when you covet something, but you cannot get it. This is where that conflict comes from. You see, this may sound very elementary, and it actually is, but James is giving us a very easy definition of what jealousy is. You see, what jealousy is is quite simple. Jealousy is when we don't get what we want. What is jealousy? Jealousy is when we don't get what we want. You see, the thing is this. At the very end of the day, I want you to think back to the things in life that make you most jealous. And you will see that they have a common thread, and that's this. We are most jealous of areas in our life that we feel are in deficit. The only reason we ever get jealous is because someone has something that we want to have. That's what James is saying. He's saying what we have, what we don't have, I should say, is what causes us to be jealous because we have a deficit. In other words, we want something, but we don't get it. Jealousy is when we get what we don't, when we don't get what we want. Now, what's funny for a lot of us, and you guys, maybe you've been here before, one of the things that happens with jealousy is this. With jealousy comes resentment. Have you guys ever noticed that a lot of times the things and the people that you talk most negatively about are actually the things and the people that you want to be? You guys ever been there? You've ever been in a room like that before? Because I know you guys are way too saved and, and too much of Christians to have done that before. But, but any of you guys ever experienced that? Where like the thing that you actually want the most you talk down on? Because what happens with jealousy is this. When there is someone, when there is something that we want, if we don't have it, if we can't get it, we will actually talk down on it. Because what happens with jealousy is jealousy turns into resentment. Now, for a lot of us, what happens, we have this jealousy in our hearts. We know it's something that we struggle with. But for a lot of us, it's like, you know what, Harrison, it's not a big deal. That's just something I have, but I'll deal with it. No one else even knows about it. You want to know what James is saying in his verse? What James is saying is that eventually our internal conflict will inevitably turn into external conflict. In other words, all of that stuff that's within you, those feelings that are within you, they're not just going to stay within you. They're eventually and inevitably coming out. Why are they going to come out? Because that's something that you want. Someone has something that you want. And if you can't get it, the emotion that builds is resentment. Now, what we said about jealousy, the craziest thing is that jealousy actually uh, often manifests itself with the people that we're closest to. And so what happens if we do not begin to address the jealousy, that internal conflict will turn into external conflict and we will see it manifest itself in our relationships. You know what's crazy? As, as Christians, the Bible says that we are called to love people. We're called to serve people. Can I be honest? A lot of times the people that we are most jealous of are the people that are above us in some way, in some form. But what's funny is that what the Bible says, the way that Jesus calls us to live, Jesus says to serve those who are in authority. In the context of relationships, because a lot of times jealousy actually manifests itself in relationships. The Bible says within the context of marriage to submit to one another, to serve one another, to love one another. Let me ask you guys a question. How can we ever serve someone, love someone, submit to someone if we are jealous of them? You want to know what the answer is? You can't. You see, for a lot of us, we don't even know it because jealousy is so subtle. But one of the things that is actually causing rifts in our relationships is that we are jealous of the people that we're closest to. And what the Bible is saying, what James is saying, he's saying what is internal will eventually become external if it is not dealt with. And so this morning, we need to deal with the thing that is within us.
Now, if you've been with us through this series, one thing that you will know is that we have said that every single emotion carries with it a debt. If you're with us for week one, guilt carried with a debt that said, I owe you. In week two, we looked at anger. Anger said, you owe me. Week three was greed, and greed said, I owe me. Now, jealousy carries with it a debt. And for a lot of us, we're saying, like, trying to think right now, like, Pastor, what could the debt possibly be that comes with jealousy? Like, I'm just not really seeing a debt associated it, associated with it. Well, here it is, and I'll explain it more in a second. But the debt that comes with jealousy is this. God owes me. God owes me. Now, for some of us, you're looking at me kind of sideways right now. What do you mean, God owes me? Like, how could, how could God owe me anything? I want us to think for a moment. Think about the things in life that you want the most, that cause the most amount of jealousy, the most amount of envy in your life. Be it charisma, be it better looks, a better job, a better relationship, a relationship in general. Come on, somebody. Like, think of the things in life that you strive after, that you want. You want to know the reality of the situation? Everything in life that you want, that you are striving after, God could give you in a snap of a finger. If God really wanted to, he could give it to me and he could give it to you. And so the fact of the matter is this, if there is a deficit in our lives, God could fill it, but he hasn't. And so therefore the debt says God owes me. Now for a lot of us, we don't see it this way. It's like, no, 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 Harrison. Like it's, it's, it's my boss who I'm jealous of. I'm just, I'm here. It's my boss. It's my sister-in-law. No, that's who I'm jealous of. It's not God. But you see, what you don't understand is that for so many of us, the reason we never have victory over jealousy is because we have pinned our problems on the wrong people. You want to know the irony of thinking that our problem is with our spouse or with our boss or with our brother or our friend? The reality is this. When we look to those people that we are jealous of, those people can do absolutely nothing to change our situations. You understand that? How can your friend make you prettier? How can your neighbor get you a better car? They can't. And so what happens is we are looking at people, but the answer really lies with God. God is the person that owes us, not people. You see, as long as we deceive ourselves into believing that people are our problem, we'll never really have a solution to jealousy. Now, for a lot of us, you're saying, man, I don't really think this makes sense. Like, I'm not sure. Like, are you sure God owes me? Let me ask you this. The last time that person that you were jealous of failed, you may have felt better for yourself for a while, but did it really actually fix your jealousy? I would probably say no. And you know it to be true. The jealousy came back. If it wasn't with them, it was with someone else. And so what we need to do, if we want to have victory over jealousy, we have to take it to the root. And look, in James chapter 4, we're going to go back. James says the very same thing. He says, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Look what he says. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. The essence of what he's saying, he's saying, if you do not have what you want, that's what we, that's what we broke down jealousy into. It's, having, it's not having what you want. He says, ask God. He says, the reason that you do not have is because you do not ask. Now, for a lot of us, you're saying to yourself, wait a second, you're telling me all I have to do is ask God? But Harrison, a a lot of the things are kind of petty. Like, are you saying that I need to go to God and say, God, I'm not happy with my looks? God, I'm not happy with my, like, am I, like, am I really supposed to bring those superficial things to God? That seems kind of weird. Guess what? In our, in our, in our journey to defeat jealousy, that's exactly what I'm saying. Look what first Peter chapter five says, verse seven, he says, cast all your anxiety on him, on God. Why? Because he cares for you. You see, what happens is jealousy builds and builds because we keep thinking that people are our problem. What God is telling us to do, whatever we are feeling, as petty as it is, as superficial as it might be, he says, bring it to him. Why? Because he cares for you. 
You want to know this truth about God? Listen to this. Whatever worries, whatever carries, cares you have in your life, as superficial as they may seem, as petty as they may seem, God says, bring them to me. Why? Because he cares for you. That means if you care, guess what? God cares. And so our solution to jealousy is not to put it on people. It's to bring it to God. Cast it on him. Now, for a lot of us, you're saying, hold on, Harrison. Like, there's, there's been times in my life I've prayed to God. And I've asked God very specifically for something. But God hasn't answered. Come on, we can be there. We can be honest. Anyone been there? It's like, I've asked, and, and he hasn't <laughs> answered. Like, what do you mean bring it to God? Look what James says next. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. But when you ask God, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you want, what you, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, for a lot of us, when we see that verse, the essence of what it's saying, you're like, hold on. So basically what God is saying is ask him and he still might say no. Like, is that, is, that, is that really what James is saying? Can I be honest? Yes. He's saying, ask him. Cast everything. Cast your cares on God. But guess what? There's still times where God will say no. Now, for some of us, you're saying, well, if God will say no, if God's not going to answer every single one of my cares, every single one of my worries, if God is not going to give me exactly what I ask for, I'll explain it like this. Uh, for those, if, if you do not know, uh, Christy and I, we have um, baby twins uh, at home. They're six months now. And uh, for anyone that's had babies or knows anything about babies, uh, one thing that happens with babies is that they go through this thing called a sleep regression. Now, what a sleep regression is, very simply speaking, is basically like the babies were sleeping great through the night. Um, and then as time goes on, they don't sleep as great through the night. Uh, they're waking up a lot. Now, one thing that happens, and if you're a parent, you know this to be true, uh, your want and your goal in life is to get good sleeps. Come on, somebody. And so it's funny, one thing that Christy and I will pray a lot of times before we go to bed, we say, God, help the babies to sleep through the night. Now, I'm going to be open and honest. Uh, more often than not, especially lately, it seems like God has not answered that prayer. <laughs> like God is just not hearing our prayers. Now, for a lot of us, that's our situation. It's like we pray, but there's no answer. Why pray then if we're not going to get what we want? Let me tell you something about sleep regression. One of the reasons that a baby will have sleep regression, this is just what science tells us, the reason they're waking up more than they did before is because their brains are developing at a rapid pace. It's because their motor skills and, and, and everything, the recognition, everything in their brain is developing. And it's developing at such a rate, there's so much going on in their head, and you guys have been there as, as adults, when your head's spinning, you wake up. And you can't sleep. And so that's exactly what's going on with babies. You're like, Harrison, where are you going with this? You see, if sleep regression, sleep regression is actually a sign of the baby's progression. You following? Sleep regression is a sign of baby progression. And so in order for God to answer our prayers, get this, the baby would actually have to stop making progress. In other words, how I would say it is this. God actually loves us and God actually loves the babies too much to answer the prayer in the way that we want him to answer the prayer. Are you guys following? God loves us too much to answer that prayer. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, would we love the babies to sleep through the night? Absolutely. Absolutely. But at the very end of the day, guess what? That's actually not what's best for them. Can, can I preach something to your spirit? Because I think this is what James chapter 4 is telling us. He's saying, bring everything, every care, every worry, every form of whatever you think you want, bring it to God. But that doesn't mean he's going to answer every single prayer. Why? Because God actually loves you too much to give you what you don't need. But guess what? Even if God doesn't answer, we still bring it. Why? Two things. Number one, when we give everything to God, it puts God in perspective. And we realize that God is the source of all of our strength. Every good thing comes from him. Every blessing comes from him. We talked about that a lot last week. We give it to God. 
because everything comes from him. And number two, the reason we give him everything is trust. It's a lesson in trust. It's a lesson that says, God, this is exactly what's inside me. This is exactly what I'm feeling. If you want to give it to me, please. But if not, I'm going to trust that you know what's best for me. And I'm going to trust that you love me so much that you won't answer prayers that actually I don't want to get answered. We need to trust him. All good things come from God. Look, I love what Hebrews chapter four says. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Hold hold this for a second. What this is saying, one of the reasons you can bring all your absolute stupid things to God, your pettiness to God, your fears to God, your embarrassing things, one of the reasons you can do it boldly is because Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He knows what you feel. And so for us as people, we always thought people were our problems, so we bring things to people. We hold it against people. God says, no, 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 no. Bring it to me because I am the one that can actually empathize with your weakness. And look what he says. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Can I be honest? Some of the things and some of the desires that we bring to God, there are gonna be things that, man, you probably shouldn't have that in you. But the beauty of Jesus is that when we give it to him, he actually responds with grace and mercy because he knows what it's like to be human. Listen to this, church. God knows what you are feeling. So bring it to him. Now, very practically, I want us to understand this. Jealousy says God owes me. God owes me. I don't have what I want because God owes me. Right now, I want to give us a quick solution for how we can alleviate jealousy in our life. Wherever you are, after this message, go to God and say, God, you owe me. Some of you guys are like, really? No, no, seriously, God, you owe me. The reason I don't have what I want is because of you. The reason I'm like this is because God, you owe me. Now, if you're like, Harrison, are you serious? I'm serious, kind of. Because the whole thing, the whole purpose of this exercise is actually to begin to put everything in our lives in perspective. Because the reality of who God is, his greatness, his grandeur, when we come before him and we say, God, you owe me, this should, and the reason I'm telling you to do this is this should make us shrivel up. Why? Because when we come into the presence of God, there should be something inside of us that when we look into the face of God, when we ponder the face of Jesus, we begin to realize, oh my gosh, God could never owe me anything because God has given me everything. What do I mean by that? Harrison, what do you mean? Can I encourage you with this? One of the reasons that God does not owe us is because God has given us everything. How has God given us everything? God came down to earth. God came down in the form of a man. God incarnate in Jesus on that cross at Calvary. He went up on that cross and the Bible tells us that he was crucified and he died for my sin. He died for your sin and for your shame. And because he rose in power, because Jesus is victorious, you're victorious. Because of Jesus, we now live under under grace because of Jesus we're the righteousness of Christ come on somebody I need to hear you this morning because of God I'm freed I'm saved because of Jesus you see when we understand that listen to this all of a sudden our life is put back into perspective the only reason I'm telling us to go to God and say you owe me is so you can actually step back and say hold on wait a second When I look God eye to eye, face to face, the only thing I should realize is that I owe God everything. (laughs) I owe God everything. Because get this, whatever we feel like God owes us pales in comparison to what God has done for us. Whatever you feel like God has left you, it's like, man, I, God has not given me what I need. Guess what? Jesus died for you, and so you therefore have everything you could ever need. Everything else is gravy. Everything else is just 
the cherry on top of the cake because Jesus has given us everything. That's the gospel. Now listen to this. Part of getting jealousy out of our hearts is number one, realizing that our problem isn't with people, it's with God. But when we take it to God, what I want us to see is, wait a second, I have no reason, I have no right to be jealous. There is no room for this, there is no need for this in my heart because God has given me everything I need. Whatever you think God owes you, it pales in comparison to what God has done for you. And so you know what will happen when we put things in perspective? That jealousy in our hearts should actually flip into gratitude. Instead of this is what I don't have, it's this is what God has done for me. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. I'm no longer a slave, but I'm a son. I'm a daughter. I have it because of grace. Grace flips our perspective. Now, for a lot of us, because what happens with jealousy, and this, that is the actual solution to jealousy, but for a lot of us, what happens is although we know God has given us everything, the reality of who we are as people, our sinfulness, our jealousy, it will still manifest itself in people. We understand the root better, but it's still going to manifest itself in people. And so what we need to do, and this is very practical, it's super simple, just two things that we can do in order that when that jealousy comes, because we can know all of this thing, all of these things, but when someone close to us, we're just, those feelings can still pop up. Two things really simple that we can do when we feel jealous. Number one is celebration. We celebrate. The, now listen, if you've been with us through this series, one thing that we have said with the solutions, we have said, man, these solutions are a whole lot easier said than done. I'm going to be honest. When it comes to jealousy, this is the easiest of all the solutions I presented in this series. Anytime you are jealous of anyone, of anything, when you feel that thing in your heart come up, you celebrate. Listen, I'm going to be open, Church Online. If there is one thing in my life that makes me more jealous than anything else, I get jealous of other churches. Now, some of us are like, other churches? Like, that's, that's weird. Um, aren't you a pastor? Like, come on, pastor, and first, don't judge me, but I'm just being totally open, I'm being totally honest, totally transparent. One of the things in my life that makes me jealous is when there are churches that do well. And, and this, is, this is amplified with church online because I can see everything that they do. I can see everything that they pump out. I can see the little icon on Facebook that shows how many viewers they have. And I'm just gonna be honest, something in my heart when they're doing well, something causes me to have jealous. I'll call it jealousy, I'll call it sin. But if there's one thing I can do every single time to alleviate that feeling, to push it away, it's so simple. All I have to do is celebrate. What does that mean? What does that look like practically? Man, I celebrate these churches. When I feel that, that jealousy coming in, I begin to praise them. You know one thing that I think Jesus set the path for, and we try to preach it in our church, and it helps me? We say this, when other churches succeed, we succeed. I succeed. Why? Because we're on the same team. Come on, somebody. We are on the same team. And so one of the ways that I can begin to, to dissipate this jealousy in my heart is I celebrate. I love talking to my pastor friends, and I love saying, man, I love what you're doing. You guys are crushing it. You guys are killing it. And I'm not being disingenuine because the fact of the matter is this. The only reason I'm jealous of someone is if they're doing something good. And so I celebrate. I say, man, you guys are killing it. Now listen, take this for whatever context. If there's someone, man, you're jealous of, the, say, oh my gosh, you look so good in those pants. Come on. You look, I, I'm so happy you got promoted. Celebrate them. Now, for some of us, it's like, you know what, pastor? I don't feel, that's our culture today, right? Like, I don't feel, therefore I can't do it. Can, can I tell you something? Put this on the screen so I can read it perfectly. It's easier to act your way into a new feeling than it is to feel your way into a new action. Lord, have mercy. I need you to write this down at home. It is easier to act your way into a new feeling than it is to feel your way into a new action. What that means is this. You don't have to feel it to act. Just act. And guess what? Your heart will follow. But for so many of us, we have it backwards. We wait for our heart to feel. But guess what? When you do that, you never act. 
And so anytime you begin to feel that jealousy creep up in your heart, you begin to have those feelings, you celebrate, you praise. You say, man, I love you. You're crushing it. You guys are killing it. Man, you guys have an amazing, we celebrate. Number two is this. We celebrate. Number two, we count the cost. Count the cost. What that means is this. Whenever anyone has achieved anything in life, there was a cost associated with it. You see, for so many of us, it's like, man, that person was so lucky. I can't believe they drive a BMW. No, they weren't lucky. They went to med school. That's why they, that's, for, it's like, oh my gosh, like if I had genetics like that, like my, I'll be ripped too. No, no, no. It's because they wake up every single day and they work out. You see, what I'm saying is most of the time, the things in life that we are jealous of, it costs someone something to get there. And so every single time you have that, again, that jealous thing begin to build up inside of you, just ask yourself, would I be willing to, am I willing to pay the price that that person paid to get there? You see this, this world that we live in, this social media world where we see the highlights, we see everyone and their platform and their glory. We, we don't always see the, the progress that it took to get there. I want to encourage you, next time you're scrolling through Instagram and you feel that jealousy thing starting to boil over, simply ask yourself a question. Would I put in what they put in in order to get there? Now, when you do that, it should do two things. Number one, it should help you realize that nothing happens by accident. But number two, it should actually cause you to celebrate. To realize like, oh my gosh, that must have been so much work for them to get where they are. We count the cost. If we want to begin to alleviate jealousy in our hearts, we count the cost and we celebrate. It's two things, super simple. Now, for everything in this series, and as we close this message, I, I don't want to just close this message. I once again, I want to close this series. If you've missed any parts, you can go back on YouTube. You can check it out. But for any of us in any part of this series, we have a problem and a solution. I believe this to be true. For every single person that has watched this series, that has listened to this series, it can go one of two ways. It can be life-changing or it can do absolutely nothing. And I, I, know, I know that it can do absolutely nothing, and it, it pains me. But I just believe this to be true. God wants to use what we have done in this series to restore relationships, to change hearts, and, and to, more than anything, do something in our lives that was not currently being done. Address the issues in our hearts. And so I want to challenge you. And again, I, I, this is for today's message, but for the whole series. Whatever God has called you to do, do not wait a day longer. Make that phone call today. Shoot that text message today. Compliment someone today. Forgive someone today. Confess today. Because every single emotion that traps us, when we address it, freedom is on the other end. But here's the beauty, and I'm going to close with this. It's not just freedom for you. Because what we have seen in this series is that our problems, our heart problems, are closely connected to the people around us. And so what that means is that if we address our problems, other people around us will actually be freed. In 1 Peter, this is the verse I want to close this series with. It says this. It says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possessions, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, I need you to understand this. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament had these things called priests. And it was only a select people, a certain bloodline. But the beauty of the New Testament, the beauty of Christianity, the beauty of Jesus is that each and every one of us are called to be priests. You want to know one of the main functions of a priest? It's to bless people. Your job as a priest is to bless people. Your job as a Christian is to bless people. And so, yeah, do we want to alleviate these problems for ourselves 100%? But I believe this to be true. When we get rid of these problems, we will not be the only ones that are blessed. I believe families will be changed. I believe relationships will be restored. I believe generational curses can be lifted. And we can bless people. 
And so right here, right now, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for all of us as we close this series that God would give us the strength to do what we know and what he's calling us to do. So let's pray this together. Everyone say, dear Jesus, I need you. God, I need you today. God, open my heart and help me to do what you have called me to do. Hey, let me pray for you guys as well. Dear Jesus, God, we thank you for this series. Open our hearts, open our minds. Speak to us, Lord, what you want us to hear. We love you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. We hope you've been blessed by this week's service. We're so glad you were able to join us. We've been praying for you. We love you. We're thinking about you, and we'd love to connect with you. So please fill out one of the connect cards. Click the link in the description, and we will be in touch with you very shortly. And for those of you who want to get to know more about Kingdom Church and what it is that we're all about and our vision and what we're trying to do here, um, we encourage you to sign up for our Growth Track program. The link is also in the description box. So please sign up. Uh, We would love to have you be part of that. um, And effectively, we'll just dive into more about Kingdom culture and get to find out what we're all about. So we look forward to having you and um, be blessed.